Jim Rogers, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Um, let's go a little bit of history. Uh, you uh, teamed up in the early 70s uh, with George Soros, had a great fun, got out in the early 80s. Quick, quickly recap, recapture what, what, what you did and how you did at such a young age. Well, we, we had a successful uh, 10 years, and I had always wanted to have more than one life, so I set off to have more than one life. I didn't want to wake up at 75 and still be looking at a computer screen. I wanted to have more than one life, so off I set to have more than one life. I retired. I was 37 and set off to have, uh, I set off to have more than one life. Any uh, motorcycle trips in the offing? Any, any more books on exotic places of the no, world? No. Uh, I... See, I went around the world in a car, 1999 to 2001, and I really haven't been on a motorcycle much since then. It, it grieves me that you ask, uh, because, you know, there's nothing, some of the finest times of my life were on, on motorcycles, including the trip around the world on the motorcycle. But now I'm doing other things. I've got two little girls. I'm living in Singapore, which is not a great motorcycle place. So now I'm doing other things. I can't imagine you uh, speeding there and getting. No, there. no. I mean the <laughs> speed limit is 90 kilometers an hour. It's not. It's not a great not motorcycle to be negotiated. place. <laughs> right, and, and not negotiable. <laughs> You're right, exactly. Um, talking about Singapore, when you moved there, you cited uh, three dates: 1807, you moved to London; 1907, you got to go to New York; 2007, you're in Asia, specifically Singapore. Why? Well, Asia, the 20th century is going to, was the century of the U.S., the 19th century was the century of the U.K., the 21st century will be the century of Asia, uh, and it's becoming more and more evident, and especially of China. I wanted my children to grow up knowing Asia and speaking Mandarin. I think the best skills that I can give two girls born in, in 2003 and 2008 is to know Asia and to know Mandarin. So there we, I couldn't do it in New York. I tried. I tried doing it in New York, but it was not possible, so there we are. Uh, what, what do you uh, see as the problem with the U.S.? Why? The main problem is the staggering debt. I mean, it's just, we are the largest debtor nation in the history of the world, Steve, as you, as you undoubtedly know, because you probably read Forbes. Uh, it's, it's amazing how, how high the debt is. And it's going up by leaps and bounds. It's just, it's mind-boggling how fast it's going up, and nobody seems to understand or care what the significance and the consequences will be. And it's not good. It's not good news. In the past, we've had some uh, rough periods. I remember the Malays of the 70s, and the U.S. has uh, come back. You don't see that happening again? Or are we just digging the hole so deep we're not going to be able to get ourselves no, out? There will be rallies. Uh, the U.K. In, two th in 1918 was the richest, most powerful country in the world. There was no number two. But by, in three generations, they were bankrupt. Now, in that period of time, they had some, some rallies, as you probably well know. They won the Second World War, for instance. So they had some big rallies. But basically, they were in decline. I would like to think that there's something which is going to save us. I can think of some things which will give us rallies, but I cannot see anything. I mean, look at Japan. Japan has staggering internal debt. They're still a creditor nation. They still, uh, externally, a creditor nation. They still have a balance of trade surplus. We're the largest e external debtor nation in history and the largest internal debtor nation in history. We'll have rallies, but Steve, I don't see what can cause us to, uh, you know, we peaked in perhaps the 70s. Uh, we're in relative decline. I don't think that's, uh, maybe you would like to debate that. I don't think so. Uh, I don't see that, we, that the relative decline will, will stop. Now, uh, in terms of investing, uh, commodities, you have uh, the Rogers Global Resources Equity Index. Um, you don't see the dollar eventually getting strong again? Do you think well, commodities I actually own the dollar. I actually own the dollar as we stand here. Uh, I bought the dollar 15, 16 months ago. Uh, That's 17. just a bear market rally? It's a bear market rally, uh, yeah, in my view. Although I may buy more. Uh, in the, uh, when I walk out of here, I may buy more. Uh, no, I don't see it anything more than a, than a bear market rally. But, you know, some of the other, I own several currencies around the world. Some of the others may, there may, there may be a time Steve, in the foreseeable future when we're, all of us are going to be getting rid of our paper money because it's being debased all over the world. One reason I own the dollar is because everybody's panicked about the debasement of these other currencies. Uh, paper money is, is suspect. So it's just the best house in a bad neighborhood. I'm not even sure it's the best house in a bad neighborhood, but it's a good house in the bad neighborhood for the moment, for the moment. Uh, getting back uh, to, to commodities, what, what makes you bullish on commodities? Well, there's been a huge dearth of 
in investment in productive capacity for 30 years now. I mean, the, there's been, you know, the last lead smelter built in America was built in 1969. Been no gigantic elephant oil fields discovered since the 1960s. I can go agriculture. Ag Steve, we're going to have huge. You should start an agriculture magazine because the profits in agriculture. Share with us the observation you made about uh, somebody majoring in public relations and agriculture. Oh, yeah, okay, well, well <laughs> done. More people in America study public relations than study farming. We have no farmers. You went to Princeton. Nobody you went to school with became a farmer. I went to Yale. Nobody I went to Yale with became a farmer. Let me tell you that the average age of farmers in America is 58 years old. In Japan, the average age is 66. In Australia, it's 58. Hundreds of thousands of Indian farmers commit suicide every year. It's a disastrous business. In the UK, the highest rate of suicide is in agriculture. It's been a horrible business for 30. Prices have to go up, have to go up a lot, or we're not going to have any food at any price. So unless, unless you're going to become a farmer. Uh, then we truly starve. <laughs> uh, uh, but you uh, pointed out we have uh, 200,000 PR graduates, 20,000 farmers coming out of our schools, and you have a wonderful phrase, you can't eat press releases. That's exactly <laughs> right. You cannot eat press releases. Well, it was actually 200,000 MBAs we have coming out. That's even worse. We have more people doing MBAs than doing PR. So no, it's, it's, it's going to be a huge shift in American society, American culture, and the places where one is going to get rich. The stockbrokers are going to be driving taxis. You know, the smart ones will learn to drive tractors so they can work for the smart farmers. The farmers are going to be driving Lamborghinis. I'm telling you, you should start Forbes Farming. And uh, in the 1970s, we heard the same thing, and it didn't happen. Why? Well, farmers did make a lot of money in the 1970s. And then lost it all in the 80s. Well, yeah, yeah, but that but actually started before. That's my point. These things go in cycles. Mm -hmm. There has never been any bull market which has lasted forever. No bull market in the history of the world has lasted forever. These commodity cycles come and go. On average, they've lasted 18 to 20 years in the past. I have no long idea how long this will last, but it's, it's not over yet. Thoughts on gold? You were uh, suspicious in uh, late 2011, not without reason. Where does that go from here? Well, I own gold. I'm not selling my gold. I'm not even hedging my gold at the moment, although I'm thinking about it. Uh, gold's up 11 years in a, in a row, which is extremely unusual, as you know, for any asset class. It's correcting right now. I would suspect it's going to continue to correct. There's some things going on in the world. I mean, the Indians are coming down hard on gold, and they're the largest consumer of gold in the world. So it may continue to, to correct. If so, and if it goes down further, I hope I'm smart enough to buy, to buy more, to buy a lot more. The bull, bull market in gold is not over yet, Steve. Going back to Asia. Uh, China, you have not been a big fan of stocks. You are of the currency. How do you play China now? Well, the best way to play China is commodities because they have to buy commodities. If you've got cotton, they will take you to dinner, they will pay for your dinner, and they'll pay you on time. You don't have to worry about corporate governance or any of that kind of stuff. They don't care who the head of the Federal Reserve is if you have cotton because cotton is its own world and many other commodities as well. The renminbi, I own the renminbi as well. It's a good way to play China. Uh, I don't buy Chinese shares except when they collapse. They collapsed last in November of 08. I bought more Chinese shares. Uh, if and when they collapse again, I'll buy more. My Chinese shares are for my children. They're not for me. Now, uh, looking at China itself, um, can they become, as the U.S. Uh, has been, an innovative economy instead of a catch-up economy? Are they going to... Uh, do well, the real value-added stuff? Do you see the changes coming on that? There's a dramatic, that first time I went to China 25 or 30 years ago, there was one radio, one TV, one newspaper, one way to dress, one everything. That's changed dramatically, as you know. Uh, in China now, they, they produce something like, I don't know, 20 times as many engineers every year as we do. They didn't in the past. It was, you know, it was a very closed and, and traumatic society, uh, an autocratic society. That's changing rapidly. I suspect, yes, some of these engineers are going to turn out to be hotshot engineers. I don't know when, I don't know where, but China has a long history 
of entrepreneurship and capitalism. They've been disastrous at times in their history, but they've also been spectacularly successful at some times in their history. So teach your children Mandarin. Teach your grandchildren Mandarin. You're not a fan of India. No, no, no. I'm short <laughs> India, as a matter of fact. I'd love to go there. If you can only visit one country in your life, Steve, I, for whatever reason, I would urge you to go to India. There's nothing quite like it from a tourist point of view. But as far as a bureaucratic maze, uh, it's the worst bureaucracy in the world. They don't like foreigners. They don't like capitalists. They don't like people making money. Uh, it's a fabulous country to visit, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to do business there. So what's happening in high tech is just an outlier? Yeah, very much so. I mean, you can probably name four or five companies. I doubt if you can name four or five. You could probably name two or three high-tech countries. Steve, there are a billion people in, in, in India. We hope that somebody's successful. We hope that some of them, and, and most of the outlying outliers, that you, the successful Indians that you know live in Europe or America. There are very few great success stories in India itself. There are. They exist out of a billion people, of course. Japan. They well, are going to get out of this rut. I own the currency, and, and when they had this tsunami, I bought uh, shares. As a matter of fact, that they collapsed, as you know, and it's always been a good thing to do when there's a huge, I mean, a natural disaster. It's usually a good thing to do to buy into the market. Uh, I doubt in five years I will own them. I doubt if I'll own the currency or the shots. I mean, Japan's got staggering problems. They've got the highest internal debt in the world. And they've got a declining population. I mean, they've got serious problems. Talking about it, debt, India's piling on debt, too. I know. That's what, I'm short Indian. That's one reason I'm short India is because they've got this huge debt, which for some reason are all these bulls walking around and don't seem to understand that India has a debt-to-GDP ratio of 90%. And they're still bullish. I, they don't do their homework. You going in uh, Myanmar? I'm extremely optimistic. If I could put all of my money into Myanmar, I would. I cannot because... Steve, you and I are citizens of the land of the free, and in the land of the free, we cannot invest in Myanmar. <laughs> everybody else can. The Japanese, the, everybody's pouring into Myanmar except all of us from the land of the free. It is, it is, it is so exciting. It is like my, in Japan, in, I mean, uh, sorry, uh, China in 1978. It's exactly the same place. It might be more exciting because it's been such a disaster, such a disaster for 50 years. And now they're opening up. They're right between... India on the left, China on the right, huge natural resources, 60 million people, disciplined, hard work, uh, educated. Oh my gosh, it's such an exciting opportunity, but all you and I can do is, I can read about it in Forbes, I can't do anything. <laughs> Where else are you doing things? Well, uh, the other place that I'm, I see wildly exciting things is North Korea, but we can't do anything there, there's no market in North Korea, either. but there's going to be a merger soon of North and South Korea. And, that's going to be a very, very exciting place. Then you'll have a country of 75 million people right on the border of China, uh, huge labor pool, lots of natural resources in North Korea, and uh, they're going to run circles around the Japanese. The reasons the Japanese don't want it to happen is because they don't want a huge new competitor. They got their own problems. Uh, North Korea, I wish I could find. I'm, I'm looking for ways to invest. I have a couple of ways, but they're not, you know, not uh, of great interest. Um, these are the places that I find the most exciting. But as far as stocks, for the most part, I'm short stocks. I don't own many stocks in the world. I, my own, I own commodities. I own currencies. And I'm basically... Vineyards? Vi not any vineyards. No, that's a good idea. I don't own any... No, I don't own any vineyards. No, I, I, I drink the stuff. I don't, I don't <laughs> grow it. <laughs> it takes too long to grow it, so I'd rather drink it. And uh, so, uh, to, to sum up, uh, the U.S. long-term secular decline, Asia despite certainly, its certainly, certainly relative secular decline. There's no question about that. There are we we may have a, lo a lot of oil. You know, when the U.K. had a big rally, went bankrupt in the '70s, it had a big rally. Uh, because the North Sea oil started flowing. I know Margaret Thatcher takes credit for it. It was the North Sea. The North Sea oil started flowing in 1979, same year Margaret Thatcher uh, came to power. If you give me the largest oil field in the world, I'll show you an extremely good time, as you can imagine. We may have the largest oil field in the world with all this oil shale and uh, natural gas, shale gas. Uh, if they can solve the environmental problems. That would cause a huge rally in the U.S. We're very good at agriculture, or have been. 
that could cause a big rally in the U.S. So don't give up on the U.S. I, I own the dollar. Uh, I'm a U.S. taxpayer, U.S. citizen. So don't give up on the U.S. But it's, I'm afraid it's nothing more than a secular rally because we are the largest debtor nation in the world and nobody cares except, I mean, nobody except me and you. I know you care. But other than the two of us, nobody seems to care. So why aren't you running for president? No, no, no. no Might no, do better no. than I did. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no, that's why I'm not, because I know I wouldn't. And second of all, I mean, I, you think I want to spend my time being nice to people I don't want to be nice to? You tried that. I mean, <laughs> I, I can't imagine it's a lot of fun going out day to day being nice to people you don't want to be nice to. And I don't want to do that. Jimmy, thank you. Thank Appreciate you, Steve. It. Good fun, as usual.